when the SUVs first came out, people were like, I can't drive what? that. That big old Special thing? Ladies, that's a tank. I can't see out of that. I'm going to murder somebody in that. That's, whew, that's too that's big. That's too big for me. But they convince people, this is you safer. Need this you need this a big a car. car. You need this Bigger. for your family. Safer. The idea of a, uh, of a penny-pinching EV1 that was super green, you know, that didn't get a lot of traction, whereas the idea of a gigantic uh, SUV that would, you know, crush your neighbor, that did get a lot of traction. Basically, that tells us what the 90s was about. What began as a $25,000 tax break grew to $100,000 when Congress passed the president's economic stimulus package last spring. We think small businesses need to have support at this time to keep them afloat, to keep the economy moving ahead. But there's an encouragement for the small business person, not just to stay afloat, but to go buy the biggest gas guzzler <laughs> there is, the 6,000-pound car, the biggest. Does that make sense? I, I don't think we can, we can dictate what vehicles people buy. I think the goal this here is... This is encouraging is... them. I mean, you can almost buy the whole car for the tax break. Well... <laughs> I, I'm not going to concede that that would be the way these would be used or that... Well, there's some would... evidence that is how they're being used. Well, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see what, what happens. My Maserati I lost my license. Now I don't drive. Lucky I'm saying I don't want to see Hummers driven off the market by the government. I, I want to see everything given a, a level equal chance. The thing that bothers me is that, that, in fact, it's not a level equal chance. We're using our military to ensure the flow of oil. We, we're using tax dollars to support the car companies in different ways. And we're not using our uh, tax money to do the things that we really need to do to prepare for the future. Federal policy has always had tremendous power to shape the future. As it gave enormous incentives to buy SUVs, the federal government also sued California to stop the electric car. Some pointed to the influence of the oil and auto industries. They control things in Washington, they and the automobile industry. Now they've got Andy Card, their former lobbyist, right there as chief of staff in the White House. And I guess they don't have to pay lobbyists anymore, uh, so they're saving a little money there. Andrew Card was chief of staff when the Bush administration joined the suit against California. Card had also been president and CEO of the American Automobile Manufacturers Association during its campaign to kill California's electric car mandate. Industries began to see, if we don't kill this cancer in California, it's going to spread to the rest of the country. And I think it became a strategy um, on the part of many companies to, to make it a national issue. I was even told once by a very prominent congressman, who I shall not mention by name, that, that I can understand and tolerate uh, what you're doing in California. But if you ever try to spread your California program to the rest of my country, I'm going to have to do battle with you. Sometimes I listen to the energy debate and I think I'm watching an old movie uh, that was made back in the 70s because the discussion is exactly the same as it was 30 years ago. Our average vehicle, average car on the road is less efficient than it was 20 years ago. And this is just a complete abdication of leadership, political leadership, really, uh, because it's impossible to get fuel economy standards passed through the US Congress. After the OPEC oil embargo in the 1970s, the U.S. government created Corporate Average Fuel Economy, or CAFE standards, to improve fuel economy in American vehicles. As a result, in less than 10 years, fuel economy increased by more than 50%. Unfortunately, two decades later, there has been virtually no change. Jimmy Carter was the last president that really made uh, energy 
uh, a high priority, and he devoted his first 90 days in office to putting together an energy plan. Uh, I was there as part of it, and uh, no president since then has put that kind of effort into it. I am tonight setting a clear goal for the energy policy of the United States. Beginning this moment, this nation will never use more foreign oil than we did in 1977. Never. There was just a radical change when Ronald Reagan came in and took down the solar panels off the White House roof that Jimmy had put up and essentially declared war on the sun. I put a freeze on pending regulations and set up a task force under Vice President Bush to review regulations with an eye toward getting rid of as many as possible. I have decontrolled oil, which should result in more domestic production and less dependence on foreign oil. When Reagan came in, he was not a supporter of fuel economy, of conservation, of renewables. And in the mid-1980s, he basically stopped any improvements in fuel economy standards for cars. And then in 1985, the price of oil collapsed. I would not lay all of the blame at Ronald Reagan's feet by any means. Uh, I think he had his share of responsibility, but so did the Saudis, who made the very calculating decision to drop the price of oil dramatically, principally to ensure that none of these alternative fuels and, and energy saving measures really produced the desired results. So they kept the junkie hooked up, in other words. And as a result, we are today still addicted to oil. When Clinton came in, and I worked for Clinton, we were definitely quite interested in trying to uh, come up with alternatives and, and improve the fuel economy of the fleet. Politically, it was still very unattractive. The automobile lobby was quite powerful then, so the administration kind of made a bargain with the automobile companies, this partnership for a new generation of vehicles, where we would develop hybrid vehicles, a combination of a gasoline engine and an electric drivetrain. In return, we wouldn't really pursue fuel economy standards. I never met a five-year-old kid like this in my life, and when I shook hands with him, he said, I'm glad to meet you, Mr. President. I want you to make a car that runs on electricity and doesn't pollute the air. <laughs> and I was so impressed, I went to get Al Gore, and I introduced him to this five-year-old boy, and he said, hello, Mr. Vice President. I intend to spend my life working on this, and he said, I am going to help you develop an electric car that has no pollution. And he, Al Gore says, that means we're going to be partners. He said, yes, I guess so. But you don't understand, I'm going to spend my whole life on this. <laughs> For eight, nine years, we spent about a billion dollars of the taxpayers' monies to develop hybrid vehicles. And ironically, the U.S. car companies didn't put any hybrids on the road. And in fact, the minute George Bush got elected president, the U.S. car companies walked away from hybrids. But, and this is the irony, the U.S. program got the Japanese very nervous. So Toyota and Honda, in response, developed hybrids because uh, they didn't want to be beaten by the U.S. Uh, now they lure people into thinking they're doing something by their sweet talk. Uh, but I remember way back yonder, they used to have this joke, and it's not a joke anymore. We're giving the environmentalists the music and the industry the action. The second step toward making America less dependent on foreign oil is to produce and refine more crude oil here at home in environmentally sensitive ways. By far the most promising site for oil in America is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska. While it is predicted that the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge could supply America with slightly more than one year's supply of oil, simply raising fuel economy standards to 40 miles per gallon could save the same amount of fuel within 15 years. The oil industry and the automobile companies are resistant to change. The American people need to be reminded that it took a law to get seat belts in the cars. 
It took a law to get airbags in the cars. It took a law to get the mileage up from 12 to 20 miles per gallon. It took a law to get catalytic converters to control the pollution. And I think clean cars are too important to be left to the automobile industry. The California mandate forced automakers to make electric cars. When California changed it, the cars vanished. Why did California retreat from the bold law it created? Uh, having visited all the car companies, they were saying, well, look, we can't produce these increasing numbers of the uh, battery electric vehicles. And uh, I became convinced that what are we supposed to do here? Is our job to clean the air? Or is it to force a certain number of a type of technology on the road? Alan Lloyd uh, failed in his leadership to, to really steer the zero emission vehicle mandate toward a, a successful outcome. Oh, I know Alec very well. I, mean, you know. I know Alec very well. And uh, we had some, we had some uh, heartfelt uh, memos going back. And it pained me because I have the utmost respect for Alec. And it really pained me to be, be uh, accused of uh, basically abandoning uh, the battery electrics. In addition to his role as chairman of the Air Resources Board, Alan Lloyd had another position. Just four months before the meeting that killed the electric car, Lloyd accepted the chairmanship of the California Fuel Cell Partnership. I've been involved with hydrogen since the early 90s. When I became chair of ARB 10 years later, I knew a lot about hydrogen. So for me, I'm very much fact technology driven. And so maybe you can say that's an asset or a handicap in terms of hydrogen, because I, I, I knew what, what, what could be done. Uh, excuse me here, I want to watch my little baby get off here. Car makers convinced California that the facts supported the development of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Were they a better option than electric cars? Toyota's national manager of advanced technologies, Bill Reinert, took their prototype hydrogen fuel cell SUV on a press tour. One of our customers really didn't like this car anywhere near as much as his EV1. And the reason was not because it had anything but bad about the car. The reason was because his EV1, he could charge it at home, to charge it at work. And even though it provided limited range, um, he didn't have to worry about getting his car charged up. With this car, with a limited access to a hydrogen filling station, he said he spent his whole day planning how to get hydrogen in the car and how to get back. It's really humbling. It's, it's the, the more you know, the more you re realize you really don't know what the issues are going to be going forward. The number one worst question is when, can, when will that be on the market? When will that be on the market? That, that's the worst question. Consumers are probably going to want to know how long it would be for this to be mass produced. That's quite a ways off. We've got some real technical issues we've got to solve with hydrogen storage, with durability, with cost reduction. Is it a practical solution at this point? The cars have a limited range. The durability of the cars isn't so very good. And the, uh, let me see what else. Oh, they don't do well in cold weather. Other than that, they're great. <laughs> Have you ever been to a dog race? You know, there's the mechanical rabbit that's out in front, and the dogs never quite reach it. Well, the fuel cell is the equivalent of that mechanical rabbit. We're going for it. For the last 15 years, they've been telling us the fuel cells are 10 to 15 years off. You're an oil company. Your business is to be selling a fuel. They think that it's a long time off, 30 years. Uh, and they want to have a product to sell. So from that point, they're protecting themselves. But the other side is they're protecting the status quo. We see in Scientific American a, a double-page ad by General Motors and Shell both, touting both the fuel cell that General Motors is doing and also Shell as a potential supplier of hydrogen. That's a yeah. If hydrogen can do a better job as an energy carrier than electricity, then by gosh, it should be the the carrier of choice. The problem is, it's not even close. How far will this car ride on that amount of fuel? Uh, it gets approximately about, uh, maybe about 100, 125 miles. Oh. Mm -hmm. 